Hello, welcome to the Monday, July 15th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Swinton, England. MageGuard is just not going away, and the latest version of this thread was written up in a nice blog post by Jonathan Klinsma. MageGuard usually manifests itself in a JavaScript library being injected into checkout pages in order to steal payment card data. Now, in the past, one of the favorite modes for MageCard to operate was essentially as a supply chain attack. The website itself wasn't as much a target as, in many cases, libraries that these websites included. While there are a number of different MageCard families out there, the one that probably caused the most of concern was the one that would inject itself into various tracking scripts and the like and then websites would include this JavaScript, including the malicious MageCard part. Now, the latest version of this is sort of a little bit a different kind of supply chain attack, not necessarily going after third-party libraries, but in general, going after open S3 buckets. Now, Amazon's S3 service has had a number of issues with attackers finding readable buckets. In this case, the attacker needs to find a bucket that's not only readable, but also writable. And this particular group will then inject this MageCart JavaScript into whatever writable JavaScript file they can find. As RiskIQ points out that this, of course, will hit a large number of websites that don't even deal with payment card data or not even the pages that actually receive the data, but still probably successful enough by just emphasizing quantity over quality, which is a little bit of a different approach for MageCard. Now, I think the countermeasure is rather obvious here. It's bad to have an open writable S3 bucket. Of course, if uh, this S3 bucket does serve JavaScript that is going to be included in a public web page, then yes, readable is okay, but shouldn't be writable. And Atlassian fixed an interesting vulnerability in its Jira product. The vulnerability does allow remote code execution if an SMTP server is configured in Jira and if the contact administrator's forum is enabled. If only the SMTP server is enabled, then the attacker will need Jira administrator's privileges. So the main problem to look for here is likely this contact administrator's form. There is no proof of concept available as far as I have seen. This is described as a template injection vulnerability. So likely some data that a user could submit via the contact administrator administrator's form isn't processed quite correctly. Updates have been made available for currently supported versions, but of course older versions all the way back to 4.4 are vulnerable as well. And Microsoft announced that it started to roll out automatic phishing detection for its Microsoft Forms product. These type of products where a user is able to set up a web forms in order to collect data have often been abused for phishing because they do use valid Microsoft URLs and are also HTTPS protected using Microsoft certificates. Google also had quite a bit of issues with that uh, with its forms product. Google's solution so far has mostly been to warn users that this page is a Google form via a message that cannot easily be hidden by an attacker abusing Google forms. Microsoft has a similar note at the bottom of its own forms, but of course it's easy for user to overlook this. And I guess that's why Microsoft thinks they need to do more about this particular problem. 
And the standard defining Bluetooth low energy does allow devices to randomize their MAC addresses while they are advertising themselves to nearby devices. This of course is designed to make tracking more difficult. We have seen similar approaches in Wi-Fi, even though in Wi-Fi this never really was sort of considered by the standard. However, turns out that for Bluetooth, according to a paper to be published by a number of researchers from Boston University. Even devices with randomized MAC addresses can still be tracked in many cases because the payload they're sending as part of the advertisement is unique and static. This in part required for authentication purposes, so there may not be an easy workaround for this. Well, and this is it for today. As usual, if you like this podcast, uh, please tell your friends or leave a good review with one of the podcast sites. If you have any other comments or so, then, well, uh, please let me know. This is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.